Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's wonderful evening with Dr. Murli Bharata. <clears throat> physiology. How do you revise physiology? Very rapidly. So we built around 5,000 very short sentenced high yield facts. You take around 30 hours to do the revision, but ultimately the questions are framed based upon the fundamentals of this uh, tweet book. So let's make the great beginning doctor. <clears throat> I hope my voice is loud and clear for all of you. Cardiac output variables, they include stroke volume, contractility, preload, afterload, and cardiac oxygen demand. So what is stroke volume? What decides the stroke volume? It is the contractility afterload, that is the pressure against which the heart is pumping, and the preload, the amount of the blood that is reaching the heart. They are the determinants of the stroke volume. Tell me the conditions with high stroke volume, anything that increases the inotropic state of the heart that lead to development of high stroke volume, like in the case of the anxiety or in exercise. What conditions lead to high preload? High stroke volume occur with high preload. For example, in early pregnancy, there is an increase in plasma volume, increased venous return, leading to high preload, leading to high stroke volume in pregnancy. And anything that lead to vasodilatation decreases the afterload, will increase the stroke volume. So high stroke volume also after with low afterload is what you have to remember for the today's tomorrow's exam. Can the online students can punch his voice uh, loud and clear for all of you, doctor? So the best way to practice is how you can summarize. How you can summarize and prepare for the exam. So <clears throat> now. Whenever there is a heart failure, how do you define heart failure? A condition with a low stroke volume, when the stroke volume is low. And a low stroke volume can occur with both systolic and or diastolic dysfunction. Now, how catecholamines affect the inotropic state of the heart? They stimulate the beta-1 receptor is there on the heart. So catecholamines stimulate the beta-1 receptor. They activate protein kinase A that lead to phosphorylation of the phospholambin. What is the word you'll remember? Phospholambin. And that will cause active calcium ATPase. That will cause increased high calcium storage. And there is a process called calcium induced calcium release. And the moment calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that leads to strong myocardial contraction. So once more summarize, the buzzwords are important. Whenever catecholamines are produced, they act on the beta-1 receptor. Protein kinase A is activated. Phosphorylation of calcium channels occur that will cause an increased calcium entry and that lead to high calcium levels inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will stimulate the release of the calcium and that high intracellular calcium increases the contractility is what you need to basically remember. Now, if there is a low extracellular sodium, What will happen? What is the effect of it on the inotropic state of the heart? Any low extracellular sodium reduces the activity of a exchanger called sodium-calcium exchanger. 
So reduced sodium calcium exchange will prevent calcium from leaving outside the cell. So more calcium remain inside the cell and that causes increased contractility. So hyponatremia increases the contractility of the myocardium is what you need to basically remember. All of you know, we use digoxin to increase the contractility of the heart. Increase the inotropic state of the heart. How does it happen? Digoxin blocks sodium potassium pumps that will cause high intracellular sodium. So remember, any low extracellular sodium or a high intracellular sodium will decrease the sodium calcium exchange. And that lead to high intracellular calcium because calcium is not moving out. And that increases the inotropic state caused by the digoxin is what you need to basically remember. Now, whenever you block the beta block, beta 1, what will happen? Beta 1 blockade will cause a low cyclic AMP. Low cyclic AMP will decrease contractility, inotropic state, and it will decrease the stroke volume. So both the contractility and also the stroke volume, both of them will decrease in heart failure whenever there is systolic dysfunction. For example, you got myocardial infarction. A part of the myocardium is damaged. That typically lead to decreased contractility, decreased stroke volume, which will decrease typically in heart failure with systolic dysfunction is what you need to remember. So whenever there is any shock, why the patient is going to hypotension? Whenever there is any shock, shock lead to acidosis. Acidosis will decrease the contractility, decrease the stroke volume of the heart, is what you need to remember. Similarly, whenever there is any hypoxia, two things, remember, hypoxia and hypercapnia, that is high PCO2 or low PO2, both of them will decrease the contractility, decrease the stroke volume of the heart is what you need to remember. Now, if you look at the calcium channel blockers, there are two types. One is called dihydropyridine type. What are the examples of dihydropyridine type of calcium channel blockers? Nifedipin, nicardipin, nimodipin, amlodipin, they're all dihydro. Whereas dilitiasm, Dilitiasm, verapamil, they are non dihydropyridine. So, verapamil, dilitiasm, like non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, also decrease the contractility, decrease the stroke volume, is what you need to remember. Now, what is preload? Preload is how much blood is coming to the heart. It depends on the venous stone. It depends on the circulating blood volume. So, preload, how will you know the preload? At the end of the diastole, how much volume of the blood is there in the ventricle decides the preload is what you need to remember. So, preload is decided by the ventricular end diastolic volume. It depends on venous stone and circulating blood volume. So what is the effect of nitroglycerin-like drugs? They are all vasodilators. Vasodilators like nitroglycerin decrease the preload is what you need to remember. Next comes afterload. Afterload means whenever there is any vasoconstriction, arterial vasoconstriction, arterial vasoconstriction, that will cause increase in the mean arterial pressure. It is the mean arterial pressure against which the heart is pumping the blood out of the heart into the iota. That's the reason afterload is approximated by MAP, mean arterial pressure. 
preload is approximated by ventricular end diastolic volume is what you need to remember. So what is Laplace law? Whenever there is a high wall tension, for example, um, whenever you take any blood carrying vessel, higher the wall tension lead to higher pressure and higher afterload. That is what the Laplace law is. Kiska wall, the wall of the blood vessel, higher wall tension lead to high pressure and high afterload. So whenever there is a high afterload, what will happen to left ventricle? Left ventricle will undergo hypertrophy, mainly to decrease the wall stress. To lower the wall stress, what will left ventricle will do? It undergoes hypertrophy, which is reflected when you do 2D echo. You can see the left, left ventricular hypertrophy. If you do ECG, you can see the left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, doctor. There are vasodilators which are specially arterial vasodilators. They are not venodilators. If you look at nitroglycerin or nitrates, they are all venodilators. Whereas there are arterial vasodilators. What is the example? Hydralazine. Hydralazine, like arterial vasodilators, they decrease the afterload. Whereas if you take AS inhibitors, Yes, inhibitors like in April, Ramapril, all prills, or ARBs, that is angiotensin receptor blockers, like losartan, telbisartan, valsartan, they lower both the preload and also the afterload, is what you need to remember. Now, whenever there is any chronic hypertension for a long period of time, that will lead to high mean arterial pressure. Can the online students can punch? Is the voice loud and clear for all of you, doctor? Yes. Now, whenever there is any chronic hypertension, there is a high mean arterial pressure that lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. So whenever the heart is beating very strongly, it requires high contractility. If the inotropic state is very high, it requires a lot of ATP pump to function to release the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium. That's the reason the myocardial oxygen demand will increase with high contractility. Myocardial oxygen demand is increased with the high heart rate. Myocardial oxygen demand is increased by the high afterload. It is directly proportional to arterial pressure. High blood pressure will lead to high myocardial oxygen demand is what you need to basically remember. Then any increased diameter of the ventricle, Laplace law, kya bola? Increased diameter of any chamber will increase the wall tension, which will increase the myocardial oxygen demand is what you need to remember. Now, what is coronary sinus? Most of the deoxygenated blood typically passes through coronary sinus. Coronary sinus is the venous drainage of the heart. So what is the wall tension? It follows the Laplace law, where the wall tension equals the pressure multiplied by the radius of the viscous, that is ventricle. Ventricle is a chamber. The chamber's radius the more distended, more radius. So Laplace law says wall tension equals pressure multiplied by the radius is what you need to remember. So this is how around 30 points we can revise in 15 minutes, doctor. And at this rate, we can finish 120 points revision in one hour. That means it takes 30 to 40 hours to finish one round of revision of this 5,000 tweets, 5,000 physiology tweets, which you need to master to get that dream six to seven questions correctly answered 
in the tomorrow's NEET PG exam. So keep following me. Please like this video, share this video, tell your friends about this video, about the tweet books, totally 20 tweet books I will give you. This is the second of the 20 tweet books. Already first tweet bank ebook of anatomy I already gave you. So this is the second of the 20 tweet bank ebooks. This is on physiology. So on 20 subjects, I'll give 20 ebooks and all this. What is a tweet? Tweet is a short sentence of high yield fact, less than 10 words long. That helps you to do the revision as what the examiner wanted. So good luck and keep preparing for the exam.